Good morning. Uh, today I'll be drinking one pound instant coffee for your entertainment. It looks slightly green. Um, I have real coffee, but I couldn't be bothered to make it. Um, let's jump right into it. So, we are going to be continuing. In Luke, we've got uh, the birth of John the Baptist coming up today, which is quite exciting. So, a quick recap. We have two narratives going along side by side. We've got Zechariah and Elizabeth, his wife. Um, they were both quite old and couldn't have kids. Um, had never had any kids until uh, God sent the angel Gabriel to meet with Zechariah in the temple and said, you're going to have a son. He's going to be called John. Um, Zechariah said, no way. The angel made him mute. That was their side of things. The other side, Mary, young girl, um, teenage girl, about 14-ish, um, who was a virgin, got visited by that same angel, the angel Gabriel. He said, you're going to have a son, he's going to be called Jesus, son of the Most High. Uh, go and see your cousin Elizabeth. So Mary goes and visits Elizabeth and they spend time together. Um, when Elizabeth meets Mary, the baby jumps in her womb, really excited. Um, and Mary just sings out praises to God in thankfulness. And so, yeah, and so the yesterday's reading ended with Mary uh, remained with her for six months, nope, for three months, and returned to her home. I need to have another sip of coffee, clearly, before we start. Alright, so let's get into the reading. Um, the birth of John the Baptist. So Mary's just gone home, it's now Elizabeth and Zechariah, uh, just their side and then Mary's side again. And the two stories have separated out again. Um, now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Shocker. Um, and her neighbours and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. So that's quite cool. So, obviously she'd been, we talked a lot about how she'd been in hiding, essentially, for quite a few months. And so now, all of her neighbours all of her neighbors and all her relatives find out, and they all flock to see her, and are all celebrating with her, which is really nice. Um, uh, and on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. So... Circumcision is a whole big rabbit hole that we're not going to go down. Um, really interesting though. So uh, the tradition was that you would circumcise your child eight days after they were born. If it was a boy, obviously. Um, this was a tradition that came all the way back from the Old Testament when God was giving all of the laws to um, his people, the tribe of Israel. Um, but I just thought, just to clear up whether circumcision still stands in the New Testament. I'm going to skip forward to a little passage in Galatians chapter 5. Uh, it's verse 6 where it says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. So essentially the New Testament kind of came in and got rid of the need for the law of circumcision um, for a whole bunch of reasons. Essentially, circumcision was an act of removing the flesh, um, because the flesh was tainted and um, like corrupted, essentially. Um, but through Jesus, through baptism, we're all washed clean, we're all made new. And so Jesus essentially does away with any of the need for circumcision and upholding those own laws. And the reason why I picked um, that verse in particular is because it talks about um, faith working through love. So that's sort of the new model that Jesus puts forward is live out a life of faith where you love God and you love the people around you and that's like the basis for it rather than adhering to strict laws um, though obviously there are still rules for how we should live um, sorry that was a bit of a rabbit hole but let's keep going um, and they, they being her friends and relatives um, would have called him Zechariah after his father but his mother answered no he shall be called John and they said to her none of your relatives is called by this name and they made signs to his father and cry, inquiring what he wanted to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. So yeah, Zechariah is still mute at this point, so he can't really give his input without a writing tablet. So the people come and get for him and like, what, what do you think he should be called? He says John. And they're all really confused by that um, because no, no one in their family is called John. And it was kind of a tradition that you would use family names. Um, and they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke blessing God and fear came on all of their neighbours and all these things were talked about through the hill country of Judea for all who heard them laid them up in their hearts saying uh, what will this child be for the hand of the Lord was with him so yeah it's 
prompted quite a big reaction because they've all got used to Zechariah being mute, I guess. Because even though Elizabeth was hiding away, Zechariah was still going about his priestly duties and doing all that kind of thing. And so everyone just got used to him being mute and they suddenly he writes, his name is drawn on a tablet and he can speak again. And it's this beautiful sort of uh, completion of the reason why he was made mute in the first place because uh, he was made mute because when he, when the angel came to him, he didn't uh, accept what the angel was saying, essentially. He was like, no, there's no way we're going to have a son, it can't happen. So the angel struck him mute, and now you see the other side of that, where he's like, we have a son, and I recognise that he should be called John, because God's co told us to call him John. Um, so that's really cool. Um, and so, verse 67, this is the last bit. Um, and his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying... So, for this prophecy, I'm just going to read through the whole thing, and then I can go back and pull out a couple of interesting pieces. So, try and focus on it, but equally, I'm going to go back and explain it afterwards. Uh, he prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of their tender mercy of our God, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So, what is a prophecy? Um, the sort of cultural perception that we have of prophecies at the moment um, has quite a bit of grounding in accuracy. We sort of see it as someone uh, having a vision for the future, saying like, this is what the future will be, I'm going to prophesy this, this is what will come to pass. Um, but a lot of the time, people who are called prophets throughout the Bible aren't actually spending a lot of their time talking about the future. A lot of uh, prophecies that happen in the Bible are people talking about the present. Um, one of the big um, sort of defining features of prophecy in the Bible is um, someone who has God sort of step in and fill their mind with something, um, fill their mind with a perception, and that's usually of the culture that they're in. So a prophet could be someone who just speaks directly into the heart of their culture and says uh, what's going on in it. Um, and I've once again messed up, and I'm going to have to stop the recording <laughs> because I'm going to run out of memory on my camera. Give me a sec. And we're back. That was totally my bad. Uh, let's keep going. So. Uh, prophecy is essentially something that speaks into a culture, but this one also has the, this one specifically that we're looking at, also has the element of speaking into the future of saying um, John will go forth to prepare his ways. So a lot of this prophecy, it sort of starts off looking at the past. It says, um, the Lord God of Israel, who's visited and redeemed his people, raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. So David, I mentioned him before, was an Old Testament uh, king. Um, you know, David and Goliath, that whole story. Um, yeah, so it sort of harkens back to that and says how God's been faithful throughout time. It talks about his holy covenant. So his holy covenant was essentially his promise to Abraham um, that, you know, all of the Israelite tribe would fill the whole earth and God had these big plans for them and would bring them into community um, and love with him. And so this is this is sort of that continuation, that new covenant that comes forward. Um, and covenant just means an agreement, essentially, between um, God and his people. It's God saying, I will do this for you, and giving himself genuine accountability, saying, you know, this is this is what's going to happen. I'm going to do this, you're going to do this, and this is how this will work. Um, which is really cool. Um, and so the coming of Jesus essentially marks a new covenant. So in this uh, prophecy where it says, um, uh, to show mercy, the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. So essentially that's what the covenant is saying. It's, you'll be saved from your enemies and you'll be brought into community with God um, and you'll be made holy and righteous 
uh, for all the art days. Um, and so at that point, once he's sort of established that, he was like, this is the reference point of what we're looking at. He then, uh, Zechariah then starts talking to the future. He then turns to address the child saying, and you child will be called the prophet of the most high. Um, so the prophet of Jesus, essentially, we've just outlined what a prophecy is, what a prophet is. And so John the Baptist is going to be the prophet of Jesus. He's going to come just before Jesus and he's going to point the way to him. He's going to clear the path, make everyone ready for him. Um, so that you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of sins. Um, so yeah, so essentially he's saying, look, Jesus is going to come along. He's going to wipe away your debts, wipe away all your sins and give us all community with God. And it's your job to go through and prepare the way for him. Um, so no pressure or anything. Um, yeah. So a couple of the overall sort of points on this uh, passage. I thought it was really interesting, like the structuring of it, um, because you have Zechariah's prophecy. And yesterday we had Mary's uh, Magnificat, her sort of song of praise. Um, and they both, it will be like a chunk of story and then uh, Mary's song of praise and chunk of story and prophecy. And it's sort of, it seems like this sort of mirrored kind of structure, which is quite interesting how the book sort of flows through like that. I guess that's the English student in me I'm talking because it kind of marks a transition point now where this is kind of the end of the John the Baptist story for now and it moves into the Jesus story going forward. Um, which, yeah, the last verse, verse 80, which I didn't read. And the child grew and became strong in spirit and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. So... It's cool, it's cool. It's just setting up for what's to come. Um, and so we'll get into what is coming next tomorrow. I'll see you all then. I hope you have a wonderful day. Love you lots. Peace out.